Welcome to this message by Ray Stedman titled, A Song of Foundations, from raystedman.org. The text for this message is from Psalm 1. Just 19 years ago, we began here, and uh, we're starting, therefore, our 20th year of ministry here at, at the church. And it's wonderfully encouraging to see this auditorium filled to the full, overflowing, in fact, and... Uh, it reminds me that I should remind you that uh, we're planning to start double services in October, the 1st of October, in order to take care of those who want to attend here. I'm also beginning a new series this morning, and uh, we'll want to spend the next few weeks together uh, discovering some of the richness of what in many ways is regarded as the richest part of the Scriptures what uh, Charles Spurgeon called the treasury of David, the Psalms. And we'll begin a series in these this morning, and uh, we'll be occupied with that in the weeks to come. I think the Psalms are particularly appropriate for our day because they are the folk songs of the Bible. And uh, this is a day and generation that loves folk songs. These Psalms are the experiences of the Christians and believers of the past, and uh, they reflect all the emotional upsets and problems and disturbances that saints of the of old have gone through, and how they found their way through. And they're wonderful, therefore, for helping us in emotional pressures. There's no book like the Psalms to uh, meet the need of our heart when we're either discouraged or defeated or elated and encouraged to express these emotional feelings, this book is absolutely without peer. And they're wonderfully helpful because they teach us how to find the way through many emotional problems. So if you're not acquainted with the book of Psalms, you've missed a tremendous part of the Word of God. And we want to give ourselves to these uh, marvelous folk songs that are much like the ballad style of music that we hear so much today, simply recounting experiences that various men and women of the past have gone through. Now, most of the psalms, as you know, were written by David. Not all, by any means. Some were written by uh, some of his uh, choir leaders in Jerusalem, Asaph and uh, Jedithan and others, Ethan. These names appear in the psalms. One or two were written by Moses, and one or two by King Solomon. And there are several that it's almost impossible to tell who was the writer of them. But uh, this is a collection that has been put together by the early Hebrews in order that we might understand what God is, uh, what the people of God have, have gone through and how they found their way through them. Now, many of you may not know that the Psalms... Uh, divides into five books, and these five books of the Psalms are similar in theme to the first five books of the Bible, uh, what is called the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy <clears throat> make up the introduction to the whole Bible. And in a remarkable way, the five books of the Psalms follow the themes of these books. The first book of Psalms ends with verse, uh, Psalm 41, and it covers what Genesis covers, an introduction to human life and a revelation of the need of human heart. It's the book of foundations. And then the, the second book of Psalms begins with 42 and runs through Psalm 72, and this is like the book of Exodus. It's the book of redemption, the story of God's moving in human history to change and redeem people and save them from themselves. The third book begins with Psalm 73 to Psalm 89, and it's like the book of Leviticus. It's the book uh, in which uh, we learn how to, how to draw near to God, how to worship him, the provision God has made for his people to be near to him. And then Psalm 90 to 106 is the fourth book, and this is like the book of Numbers, the book of wilderness, of wanderings, of testings, of problems. And finally, 
the last book, 106 to 150, is the book that is like Deuteronomy, the second law, that is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which sets us free from the law of sin and death. And the way God finally has accomplished the redemption and the sanctification, the changing of human lives into the kind of men and women that he's designed. Now, Psalm 1, which we'll look at this morning, introduces the whole book of Psalms, and especially the first book of the Psalms, uh, the book that accords with the book of Genesis. And this Psalm, as you've already heard it, is a division between uh, it, it's simply a description of the wicked and the righteous. Now, I don't blame Mr. Coleman at all for having refused to have read the latter few verses. Some of us heaved a sigh of relief when he, we saw that he was not going on to describe the right of uh, the wicked. But uh, uh, nevertheless, the, the psalm covers both of these. It describes for us the God-centered life and the self-centered life. And when this psalm talks about wicked people, it's not talking about uh, murderers and rapists and dope pushers, and, uh, the kind of people we usually think of as wicked. Uh, we usually think of some notorious person, like Senator Ed Edward Kennedy or someone like that, as wicked. But uh, <clears throat> the psalm here does not mean that. It really means the ungodly, that's all. The man who has little time for God, little or no time for God in his life. That's the wicked person. Uh, someone who has ruled out of his affairs and his thinking the greatest being in the universe. The one who makes sense out of life. The one around whom all of life resolve, revolves. Now to eliminate him from your thinking and your attitude is to be wicked. It's to be ungodly. And in contrast with that, the God-centered life is set before us and the results that come from that. Now, that's the simple division of the psalm into those two parts. And we'll start now by looking together at what it says about the God-centered life. David cries out, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now that's a description of the godly life, the God-centered life. And it begins with the word happy. It doesn't, in our version, it says blessed, but blessed is one of those code words which only Christians use. And it really is the word for happy. So that here you have the secret of happiness. And you, some of you may recognize that that's exactly the way the Lord Jesus began the greatest sermon that's ever been uttered before men, the Sermon on the Mount. He starts with what we call the Beatitudes. That's another code word. That means the blessings. And blessings is a code word which means happiness. And so the Beatitudes are the secrets of happiness. And he starts on that note. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Happy are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And here the psalmist is giving to us the clue to happiness. Oh, the blessedness, he says. Oh, the happiness of the man who lives like this. And then he gives it to us, the description of this man's life, both negatively and positively. You notice, first the negative. Who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. And you'll notice he gathers up in three words there a description of all of life. Who walks, who stands, who sits. Walk, stand, and sit. Some of you have read a little book by Watchman Nee called Sit, Walk, and Stand, uh, which is a description, a wonderful description of the life of a believer in Jesus Christ. But here is the Old Testament description, description of the man who is not a believer, the ungodly, 
who walks in a certain way and stands in a certain way and sits in a certain way. And you'll notice the progress in evil here. He speaks of the wicked, of sinners, and of the scoffers or the scornful. And uh, what this man is pointing out to us here is the ungodly are characterized by a different way of life. Uh, to walk means uh, is a reference to all the little decisions that we have to make all day long. You know how that is. You take s little steps all day long. You're making little decisions about all kinds of matters all day long, and that's walking, taking a series of steps. To stand is a picture of the commitment we make to certain causes. Uh, we give ourselves to certain things. We take our stand upon certain uh, important matters in life. And to sit is a picture of the settled attitude of the heart, the continuous disposition of our life. Now, says the man, the man who has found the secret of happiness can be recognized by the fact that he does not walk in the way of the wicked. That is, he doesn't make his decisions on the basis of the philosophy of those who are ungodly. He has rejected the philosophy of the ungodly. What's that philosophy? What would you say is the philosophy by which the world runs? The ungodly world. I think it can be put in, in three simple propositions. Me first. Get it now. Avoid the unpleasant. Isn't that the philosophy of the world? Me first. Get it now, don't wait, <laughs> have it right now, and if anything is unpleasant, forget it, run away from it. Now that's the philosophy, the counsel of the ungodly, the wicked. And the man who has learned the secret of happiness rejects that. He doesn't make his decisions on that basis. Second, he does not stand in the way of sinners. And this word for sinners is a most interesting word in the Hebrews. It's a word in the base, in its root meaning, which, uh, which means to, to make a loud noise or to cause a tumult, is the idea, to provoke a riot, to be a disturbance, to make trouble. That's the idea. And here the psalmist says you can recognize the godly man in that he doesn't make trouble. He doesn't provoke riots. He isn't around causing disturbances. He's obedient to the laws of life and the land. He doesn't stand in the way of those who go. That doesn't mean he, he, he resists them. The word stand doesn't mean stand against. It means he, he doesn't even lounge around the direction of those who are going in that way. He has rejected that. And third, he does not sit in the seat of the scoffers or the scornful, those who blame everybody else for what's wrong and never blame themselves. Have you noticed how easily that kind of an attitude comes to our heart? Anything goes wrong, it's somebody else, isn't it? The parents blame the children, the children blame the parents, and they both blame the schools. The schools blame the parents and the government. The government blames the hippies. The hippies blame the government. Uh, one nation blames another nation. Uh, everybody is blaming everyone else. That's the philosophy of the world, isn't it? That's the scornful, the scoffers, those who, the cynics who have a, a cast a baleful eye at life in general and blame someone else for their problems. But the ungod, the godly, is a man who has rejected that, and he does not have that as his attitude. But you see, on the contrary, his life is characterized by, by the positive things here. He um, is selfless in his motivation. He's obedient in his actions to, uh, to law, obedient to law. And he... Uh, he does not adopt the role of the critic, but he's cheerful and acceptant from, as from the hand of God of all that comes. 
I still love that description. I never tire of, of quoting it of a Christian that says, a Christian is one who is completely fearless, continually cheerful, and constantly in trouble. And uh, this is exactly what this psalm describes. Now, that's an unusual life, isn't it? And I think most of us hearing this this morning say to ourselves, well, do I qualify for that? That's the negative side. He's not like this. But look at the positive side. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That's the reason why he's able to do the other. That's why he has rejected this other philosophy, because he's, he's learned to delight in the law of the Lord. Now, the law of the Lord is another name in the Psalms for the Scriptures. It means more than just the law of Moses. It means the whole revelation of God. And the positive thing about this godly person is that he has learned that in the book of God, he's told a completely different story about life than he gets out in the world. He's told the truth about life. And he's learned to delight in the fact that here's a book that tells him the truth and shows him a whole new way of life and a new philosophy. And more than that, reveals a power by which he can fulfill it. You know, if all that were said here is this description of the godly man in the first two verses, most of us I would agree, I think the whole world would pretty well agree that here's a man who thinks too much of himself. He thinks he's better than the rest of us. He doesn't act this way because he thinks he's better. But this second verse makes clear that that's not the reason why he does this. He lives this way. It's because he's discovered out of the law of God the truth about himself and about his need. I was very encouraged a couple of weeks ago when I was in Dallas to hear the story of one of the young men from this church who gave his testimony in a church in Dallas and he was telling about how he became a Christian during the Billy Graham crusade in 1958 at Cow Palace, and then how he started looking for churches, and he went to several churches, and he didn't feel very much at home. He'd been a, a non-churched man up to that time, never had much to do with churches at all, and he didn't like the ones he came into as a Christian. And then uh, one day he came here. And he said, the very first Sunday that he was here, I was speaking and I did something that I never did again. But it struck him most forcibly. He said that I turned and read from 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, these verses. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And he said he was so impressed when after having read those verses, I said, I stopped, and I said to the whole congregation, now that's a description of the Christians in Corinth and the life that they uh, once had led. And I'd like to ask if there are any here that have had this kind of a background. How many, I said, in this congregation have had some of these things, or one of them at least, true of you. And I read the list again. Immoral, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, and robbers. And he said one by one, all over the congregation, people began to stand to their feet. And he took one look at this great crowd, almost more than half the congregation standing. And he said, these are my kind of people.
Yes, but such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, made clean, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And that's what this man discovers when he reads the law of God. He doesn't only understand that that God demands a certain perfection, but he also learns the process by which that perfection is made possible. In the Redeemer, in the Lord Jesus, whose life he learns to share and to grow and to appropriate the strength of that Lord. And one of the delightful things about the Psalms is how many times you find this expressed. The, the fact that the psalmist has learned to draw upon the greatness and the glory of God in the midst of life. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And all through these psalms, this is what he's learned. And so he's learned to meditate on it day and night. Now, that doesn't mean he goes around thinking about the scriptures and saying them over and over all day long. That's a mechanical understanding of this verse. What it means is this man has learned that this wonderful new life made possible in Jesus Christ is available for any situation. And he keeps applying it all day and all night whenever he needs it. <laughs> whenever he needs strength, he draws upon the Lord. He doesn't just try to m mobilize his resources and to find some kind of encouragement from outsiders or depend upon external circumstances for peace and rest, he learns to draw upon the strength of God. And that's what makes the difference. And this is the secret of the godly life. This is the way you can learn to be selfless and obedient and cheerful under every circumstance. Now, the writer here, the psalmist, goes on to give us the evaluation of this kind of life. In verse 3, he's like a tree planted by streams of water. It yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in all that he does, he prospers. Like a tree planted by streams of water. I remember um, many years ago, when I was first uh, beginning work here, with young people particularly. We had a youth conference up in the Sierra Nevada. And there was a young man there who came to me uh, in the midst of that conference and took me aside. We stood out underneath one of the great Douglas firs in the Sierra. And he said to me, Pastor, he said, I don't know what's the matter with me. I want to be a good Christian, he said. And I try hard, but somehow I just never seem to make it. I'm always doing the wrong thing, and I just can't live like a Christian. And I said to him, well, uh, there may be several reasons for that, but let me ask you this. First of all, what about your private life with the Lord? How much do you know the Lord? How much do you uh, delight in reading his word and praying spending time and just talking to him. Because after all, it's not the time spent in reading the word that's important, but it's the time spent in enjoying the presence of God that strengthens you. And he hung his head and he said, well, I admit I don't do very much of that. And uh, I stopped. I just something, this very verse from the Psalms flashed into my mind. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water. And I remember stepping back and saying to him, look at this tree we're under here. What does it remind you of? What are the qualities this tree suggests to you? And he look at, looked at it, tremendous, giant uh, Douglas fir towering up into the heavens above. It. And he said, well, the first thing is it, it's strong. Yes, I said, anything else? Well, he said, it's a... Uh, it's beautiful. And I said, exactly. Beauty and strength. Those are the two things you admire about this tree. And those are exactly the two things God wants you to have. And you want in your own life, don't you? Beauty and strength. He said, that's right. 
Well, then I said, tell me this. What makes this tree beautiful and strong? Where does it get its beauty and its strength? And he stopped for a moment and looked at the tree, and then he said, well, from the roots, I guess. I said, can you see the roots? No, he said, you can't. That's the hidden part of life. But that's the secret of the tree's beauty and its strength. And that's exactly what this psalmist is saying. The man who is godly has learned in the hidden inner parts of his life to draw upon the grace and the, and the glory and the strength of God. And so his roots run deep down into rich and moist soil. And this is what makes him beautiful and strong. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, the streams of water. And he's fruitful. He brings forth fruit in its season. And I think that is a reference probably to the fruit of the Spirit in the New Testament, which is described for us. It's always the same in either, either Testament. The fruit of the character of God, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and so forth. And uh, his leaf does not wither. That means he's always vital. He's always an exciting kind of person. He's never dull, never dreary, never boring. He's an exciting, vital person because he's in touch with a vital God. And finally, uh, all that he does prospers. That is, he's effective. What he puts his hand to, he accomplishes because he's not doing it in his own strength, but in the strength of another, a hidden another within, from whose resources he's drawing. And that's, the, that's, you see, the godly life. That's the secret of happiness. The man who learns to live that way is a happy person. It doesn't make any difference what his outward circumstances may be at all. Because happiness does not consist of the abundance of things which you possess, as Jesus tells it. But this man is happy because he's learned the secret of happiness. Now, more briefly, in contrast, you see how he tells us about the other side of it? The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Now, it takes two verses to describe the secret of the godly, the, the, the life of the godly. It only takes two words to describe the life of the ungodly. They're not so. That's all. They're not like this godly man. They believe in the philosophy of the world, the counsel of sinners, me first, get it now, avoid the unpleasant. They live on that basis. They make their decisions on that basis. And they're always involved in little acts of rebellion, little or, or larger acts of rebellion. They're in violation of the fundamental laws of life. And they blame everyone else for their troubles. The ungodly are not so. See, they're not like this. But, he says, and here comes the evaluation of it, they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. I don't think you city folk understand what chaff is. Up in Montana, every year, we had the harvesters come around with a thrashing rig. And uh, the bundles of wheat would be thrown into this machine, and the straw blown out the, the, onto the stack, and the wheat would come dribbling out and be gathered up and poured into the wagons or the trucks and uh, taken away to the granary. But floating around in the air everywhere was chaff. And it was the, it was the awfulest stuff you ever saw. It stuck to the skin. Whenever you sweat, it got in the back of your neck and down your shirt and it itched and scratched and it was regarded as the most worthless stuff there was. And I was struck by the fact that way back in David's day, a thousand years before Christ, the only thing they could think of was to blow it away, the chaff which the wind blows away. And here, 2,000 years after Christ, the only thing we can think of to do with chaff is to blow it away. That's what the threshing rig does. It tries to blow it up on the straw stack and get it away. Worthless. 
And that's God's evaluation of a man who has no room for God in his life. He's like chaff. Oh, he may be most impressive in the eyes of the world. He may have a beautiful home and drive a great big car or several of them and uh, have all the luxuries of life, be regarded as a wheel and thus go around in circles. But uh, in God's evaluation of that life, he's worthless. He has never fulfilled one single thing that God put him here to do. He's waste time as far as God is concerned, worthless. Like the chaff which the wind drives away. And as a result, there are two things said of him. He shall not stand in the judgment. And that means the, ju the daily judgment of God. The evaluation that God makes constantly of our lives. This man has no standing in that at all. His life is regarded as worthless. Everything he does is just a, just so much wasted labor. Nor will he be in the congregation of the righteous. That is a reference to the final judgment. When all the redeemed are gathered together, this man will be absent. Now, he may have been religious. I rather think he was or is. But you remember Jesus said that many, many shall say in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And did we not do many mighty works and cast out demons even in your name? And he shall say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. He will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. Because here's a man who does not put God at the center of his life. And then the psalm concludes with this tremendous word of explanation. Why does all this happen this way? Why is it that though outwardly a man's life may be very impressive, Inwardly, it may be nothing but a hollow shell, empty and worthless. Well, the answer is because God knows the way of the righteous. The Lord knows that way. He's watching over that man. He's guiding him and guarding him and keeping him or her. But the way of the wicked, the ungodly, will perish. That means... It'll just dribble out into nothingness. His lamp will go out in obscurity, says the prophets. A very tremendous phrase. I don't think this has ever been demonstrated, perhaps more strikingly, than in the days of the, of the New, of the New Testament. When there came a time, you remember, when the Apostle Paul, in his journeys about the Roman Empire, stood once as a prisoner before Nero Caesar. And Nero was at that time a dissolute, vain, cruel, inhuman, implacable monster, regarded now by historians as one of the most dissolute, one of the most vile and contemptuous rulers that ever sat upon a throne. He even commanded that the body of his own mother be ripped up in order that he might see the womb that bare him. He saw a young man, a handsome young man, in his court one day, and he summoned him before him, ordered him to be castrated, and used him as a woman the rest of his life. The vilest kind of a wretch. And yet his name was known all over the empire. He was Caesar. And the whole of the Roman Empire bowed to his will. And all that was uh, the whole of life of that mighty empire revolved around this man's name, Nero, Caesar. And yet there stood before him this obscure little Jew from a forgotten Roman province named Paul, the apostle. And uh, no one knew him. He'd hardly been heard of except in a few isolated places where he'd caused some trouble. He was a prisoner in chains standing before this mighty emperor. And yet, as someone has well pointed out, the amazing thing is that today we name our sons Paul and our dogs Nero. 
The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Well, let's pray. Father, we can't read these words without asking ourselves the question, have we discovered the secret of happiness? Are we allowing this marvelous provision for producing godliness, godlikeness, to be at work in us? Or does a great deal of our life still consist of this ungodliness by which we are like the chaff which the wind drives away? Great areas of our life that are worthless and wasted because we're living on the principles and the precepts of the world around us. Lord, we thank you for having come to teach us the way of godliness and to show us the way by which your life may be manifest in us. As we come to this communion table, we come, Lord Jesus, to remind ourselves anew of the way of the cross, the way of a new life, the way of constantly judging the evil of the flesh and constantly appropriating the goodness of the Spirit, the fullness of power that he gives. Young and old alike, Father, we pray that you'll help us now to lay hold more fully of this life that our lives in the day of judgment will find value, that we as people shall stand in the congregation of the righteous, that we may live the remaining years of our life, our Father, under your eye, under your fatherly love and care, for you know the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
There I go, there I go again Let my, let my doubts win You're calling me, you're calling me your friend And you say that you stay till the end I look up to the skies And you help me to realize You will make all things new You will make all things new And when I feel lost at sea Drowning in the depths of my misery I'll lay it at your feet You make all things complete